Mr Martin Horwood. Uh, Mr Speaker, and it's a pleasure to follow uh, the Honourable Member for Eyre, uh, Carrick and Cumnock, and indeed before her, my Honourable Neighbour, the Member for Gloucester, who I thought made a typically well-informed yeah. but particularly moving speech today. I'm going to start on a slightly sober note, just a touch of realism that we in this Parliament are obviously not in a very strong position to influence events in Hong Kong. But I would say I nevertheless think it is absolutely right that we should support human rights and democracy for the people of Hong Kong and that we should support the Right Honourable Member for Croydon and his committee in stating very clearly uh, that the accusation of unjustified meddling in the internal affairs of China is not justified. And indeed, it's not justified either to try and inhibit the work of the all-party group uh, chaired by my honourable friend. And I'd happily give way to him. Just a tiny point. He's been very generous, both in what he says and giving way. Um, he mentioned we may not have much influence over Hong Kong. Of course, the whole point of this debate, in a sense, is we're not trying to influence Hong Kong. We are trying to debate and discuss issues, but we are not trying to interfere, meddle, influence, or anything else. I understand the point he's making, and I'll, I'll come back to that. I mean, I think there is an argument for us, in a sense, uh, commenting on universal human rights and thereby trying to influence the conduct of human, universal human rights throughout the world. Um, so to that extent, I think we are trying to influence events. But I think he's right that the focus of this debate is about the, in a sense, the, uh, the opposite uh, situation, which is the Chinese government attempting to, to curtail an inquiry in this parliament, uh, which is unjustified. And we're not seeking by this debate to immediately change anything in Hong Kong, it's true. Um, but I think the accusation of internal, of unjustified interference is wrong on two counts. First of all, as many uh, honourable and right honourable members have pointed out, we are a party to an international agreement to the Joint Declaration uh, in 1984, which clearly does refer uh, in Article 12 to the basic policies of the People's Republic of China regarding Hong Kong. Um, in Article 4, it said the chief executive will be appointed by the central people's government on the basis of the results of elections or consultations to be held locally. That isn't the strongest wording in the world, but it was repeated in the basic law that was also implemented uh, by the uh, joint agreement. And again, in Article 12, it was stated that those policies would remain unchanged for 50 years, and we are clearly within that timescale. And so there is a perfectly legitimate right for the British Parliament to look at how that um, basic law and how that joint agreement is being interpreted in practice in Hong Kong, particularly in the light of the announcements in August uh, by the Beijing government. But the second reason I think it is wrong to, to criticise the Foreign Affairs Committee is that we are all parties to a universal declaration of human rights at the United Nations, and that talks about human rights being inalienable for all members of the human family. And those are human rights from, uh, from Iran to Colombia, from China to Britain itself. And it is legitimate for any member of the United Nations, it seems to me, to look at the conduct of human rights worldwide, to comment on the conduct of human rights worldwide, and to take an interest in the conduct of human rights worldwide. And no parliament, no democratic assembly anywhere in the world should feel inhibited from discussing how those human rights are conducted. And indeed, it is quite common in this parliament for uh, human rights in a variety of countries uh, to be commented on, and indeed the government publishes an annual human rights report in which it comments on the conduct of human rights in every country uh, or in many countries around the world. So, uh, as Lenin once said, what is to be done? Well, first of all, I think we have to be clear that the Foreign Affairs Select Committee should continue to highlight the issues raised by events in Hong Kong, to investigate them thoroughly, and to draw reasonable conclusions without in fear of intimidation. And I think it is very clear that we say that we are, that everyone in this parliament uh, supports their right to do that and encourages them to, to continue their inquiry. Um, secondly, I think it's important that the British government does continue to raise concerns about China's interpretation of the basic law and the joint declaration uh, and <coughs> to draw on the expertise of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee and its eventual report in doing so. But thirdly, I think it does point out that um, we need, I think in this country, a, a deeper and more sophisticated policy towards China. Um, and I think 
we have had a slight tendency in this parliament and in government to have a policy that uh, addresses China as if the, the only important thing that we wanted to do was to, frankly, buy and sell more widgets, uh, that trade was important, that capital investment was important, and that was almost to the exclusion of other considerations. Uh, and I think what's been reinforced by, by many honourable members in this debate is that that is not um, the case, that trade is important, capital investment is important, um, but that policies have to be wider and more sophisticated than that. Now, part of that policy has to be also, from our side, understanding China, understanding Chinese sensitivities and Chinese history uh, and the progress that China has made. And that has to be sometimes acknowledging that our shared history with China has not been particularly glorious on the British side on many occasions. We have to acknowledge um, that our role as a colonial power and in events like the Opium Wars uh, was, in retrospect, now quite disgraceful. That we have perhaps undervalued contributions like that of the 96,000 members of the Chinese Labour Corps during the First World War who behaved with complete heroism and lost thousands of their numbers but have, were treated pretty disgracefully uh, at the time and have equally disgracefully been neglected for their heroism and their contribution to this uh, country in the, in the First World War. And I think there is a, uh, a broad-based campaign which is now seeking to rectify that omission and to um, obtain a memorial to the Chinese Labour Corps in this country. And I hope that's something that could also uh, attract government uh, support. And we have to acknowledge our own failing to deliver democracy in Hong Kong. We were the administrators, we were the rulers of Hong Kong for many years, and we never delivered a chief executive who was uh, elected by the people of Hong Kong without interference. Uh, we appointed a colonial governor, and some of those colonial governors, I'm sure, were very talented and very skilled and very caring people, but they, it was, in a sense, a benign colonial dictatorship. So it is, uh, it is a difficult thing for us no, to now turn around and criticise China for the way they are behaving to Hong Kong, and we have to be sensitive to that. <clears throat> yes, I will be one. I think it's important to remember that the committee has not come out with any conclusions at all about the rights and wrongs of the situation. What we are protesting about is that we have been refused access to Hong Kong. Yes, I completely accept that, and the Honourable Lady is, is right to emphasise that. But I am just talking in the wider context about the need for us to have a sophisticated approach to China, which isn't constantly hectoring them for any failings we may detect on their side without acknowledging that over the long period of history, which the Chinese do uh, address, um, um, I mean, look at the long, the long uh, picture very much indeed in, in their approach, uh, that we need to acknowledge there have been historic failings on our side and historic injustices and um, omissions on our side as well, and we have to be honest and, and appreciate that. But a policy that is sophisticated towards China also must include a firmness uh, in the face both of contraventions of human rights in Chinese territory, but also of uh, militarization of their sometimes unjustified um, indulgence of dictatorships in different parts of the world, um, even in their um, uh, the way in which they allow wildlife crime to be perpetuated in pursuit of various uh, markets for things like uh, ivory, which uh, I4 have been highlighting only, only this week in the House of Commons. Um, and I think there is a risk that in our pursuit of, of trade and investment, not only ourselves, but democracies all over the world, um, find ourselves divided and perhaps to some extent ruled by Chinese foreign policy when it... Um, seeks to intimidate smaller democracies um, and to, to influence our uh, discussion of their affairs. Um, uh, yes, I will. I, I just this week had a chance and opportunity to speak to the Chief Superintendent from Hong Kong Police. It just happened to be. But in that conversation I had with him, he confirmed with me that uh, we're very fond of demonstrations in Northern Ireland, as you probably know. Uh, there's six and a half thousand take place in Hong Kong. Would he share my, uh, my, my uh, concern to ensure that those demonstrations for workers' rights, for commemorating different events, that, that they can continue, and they can continue in the way that they have up until now, which means there's been no bother and no actions uh, and, and no friction? Um, well, I think the Honourable Member makes a very uh, important point and actually underlines the 
the difficulty sometimes of dealing with the idea of free protest, which is a fine principle, but sometimes in practice, even in our own country, even in Northern Ireland, uh, makes a, a, a difficult challenge for policymakers and for the authorities. But I think the, the right of free protest is something that is enormously important and has been hard fought for and hard won in countries all over the world, and it's something that we should uh, certainly try to defend in Hong Kong. But the point I was drawing, really, was to say that there is a risk of uh, the free countries of the world being, um, as I said, being subject to a kind of di divide and rule approach by the Chinese, and for the Chinese government to uh, use these rather intimidating tactics of trying to suppress uh, inquiries, of trying to inhibit the activities of even uh, all party groups that are nothing to do with the uh, British government, that are not part of the executive of this country, um, and part of the relationship building that has been referred to has to be to try and communicate to the Chinese government not just what we understand by the rule of law, which has been mentioned before, but the separation of powers, that the executive and the judiciary and the legislature in democracies like ours are completely separate, that they do have their own rights against each other, let alone uh, in relation to, to other countries. Um, and I think the democracies of the world must start to develop a more sophisticated approach to China so that we uh, can present at times a united front that says to China, um, you are the emerging new superpower of the world. That is quite clear. You are an enormous uh, economic and political force. You are probably a growing political force as well. You have an enormously rich and important history and a fabulous civilization, but that does not give you the right uh, to take smaller countries and democracies and economies and inhibit them from um, uh, carrying out their proper business. Yes, I'm happy to give way. Our, our links, of course, with China should also be emphasised. Um, historically, the first governor to Beijing hailed from Bali Money. His name was McCartney. Uh, but today, that link between my constituency and Hong Kong continues through the Kualong Bus Company, where Wright Bus manufactured buses here for London, but also for Hong Kong. And I think that economic link should also be used as influence to say, look, we, we have an economic driver that brings us closer together. Let's not be separated then by this division that has currently prevented members of parliament from entering Hong Kong. And I think uh, I'm happy for the honourable member to have intervened in that way, and I think it emphasises the strong cultural and human links that... Uh, uh, that we have with Hong Kong and with, with China as a whole. But it also means that countries like ourselves must uh, support those democracies in the region, like now Taiwan, where the example of Hong Kong is very important for their security and confidence. And the language that Beijing is using about Taiwan has changed subtly in the last year or so. They are talking about the problem of Taiwan not being handed down from generation to generation as if they feel there ought to be some conclusion to this perpetual debate about uh, uh, Taiwan's possible independence or possible reintegration into the, uh, the Republic or their, uh, their future in their current status. And that is a potentially threatening thing for the democracy of Taiwan, and there is, we have to acknowledge that it is potentially threatening and understand that the example of how the one country, two systems approach has worked in Hong Kong is vitally important and is being watched uh, very carefully in Taiwan. But I think the, um, uh, the underlying message of this debate must be that we have to respect um, China, that we have to understand China, and we would want China equally to understand and respect the way our democracy works, the way we separate powers between parliamentary inquiries and the executive, uh, and that the right of a select committee to look into a legitimate area of concern, both in terms of British foreign policy, but also in terms of universal human rights, is something we can and must defend.